The case that I'm going to discuss with you today has to do with a very educated person who had a very weird fetal anatomy, or uh, mom's anatomy. What we're dealing with was a bicornuate uterus, and a bicornuate uterus is one that causes problems a lot of times during pregnancy. You have a four to five times greater chance of a placental abruption. I want to talk to you a little bit about fetal monitoring strips. Um, Jennifer Piamps came into the hospital at 7.35 in the morning uh, complaining of rupture of membranes, her water broke. As soon as somebody like Jennifer Piamps, a high-risk person comes into the hospital, they get placed on fetal monitoring strips. First of all, the lines at the top are the baby and the line at the bottom is mom. And the line at the top should be somewhere between 120 and 160 at all times. Nurses are trained to look at these types of things, watch them and monitor them. If things go south or things go north of that, that's when things need to happen by a physician or healthcare provider. In this case, we have a nurse who did not understand fetal monitoring strips. These newer strips and machines will actually talk to the nurses and say, the fetal monitoring strips in this case look really bad. Very early in the day, when the placental abruption began happening, this machine said there is bradycardia. It went unnoticed. During Mrs. Piamp's 14-hour shift, she had 177 alerts. 177 alerts, none of which prompted a call to a physician. After she had been in the hospital now going on 22 hours, the baby became bradycardic. And the bradycardia that you see is that line that I've highlighted around the 50 or 60 range. That needs to be treated immediately. It's not just the baby's heart rate that you have to worry about. If you notice those black boxes at the very bottom that I've highlighted, that is the fetal movement profile. You'll see maybe one or two or three on a page. Unless, of course, you are suffocating a baby. And during the course of that suffocation, a baby will do what all of us will do, which is fight to try to save itself until, ultimately, you see the fetal movement profile stop. That means that the baby has used all of its fetal reserves, has, has completely exhausted, and is now becoming acidotic, and the brain damage is occurring. We try to think about, well, what is the defense going to do? Who's going to, try to, who's going to defend this care? Who's going to say that what this nurse did in this hospital by not calling this doctor was the right thing to do? So shortly before the deposition of the maternal fetal specialist, who was mom's doctor, who was also the head of the maternal fetal medicine department in this hospital, so in charge of these nurses, we had a conversation with him. We said, we just want you to tell the truth. That's all. No conditions. No, we're going to sue you if you don't. Just tell the truth. From the first time that we saw the bradycardic readout at 2122 up until 2138, did any healthcare provider call you and advise you that there was a non reassuring strip? No, sir. Nurses aren't supposed to wait 35 minutes when they have an inability to get a heart turn to contact a doctor, correct? Correct. If you were called at 2138 and reviewed the medical strips, I would have been a patient. Hold on one second. At 2138, you would have reviewed the fetal monitoring strips, right? Yes? Yes. And what would you have done? That they were. Immediately, correct? Correct. Doctor, you would agree with me that Nurse Lopez in this case did not interpret these strips correctly, correct? That's correct. If I would have had an older nurse with more experience, none of this probably would have happened. So not only did he give us that this nurse violated the standard of care, which is the, the tool by which medical malpractice lawyers use their, is their measuring stick. He went ahead and gave us that, I don't know if this nurse was right, the right nurse to actually be taking care of this patient. If you are a medical malpractice plaintiff's lawyer, you start thinking about caps. Caps are kind of a hot issue, particularly where this case is pending, which is in, in Florida, there is a cap on uh, non-economic damages. So how do we get around the cap? Not only did they do terrible things to this baby, and cause a devastating injury. This is a catastrophically injured kid, but of unfortunately, they have to go back to this hospital. This is the children's hospital in Orlando. The risk management folks, the doctors and the nurses, over the course of a 24-hour stay on four or five separate occasions walked in and said, are you ready to sign the DNR? DNR for do not resuscitate. Have you considered pulling the baby off of the life support? Have you con considered only giving palliative care and, and not treating the pneumonia? They damn near kill the kid, cause a devastating injury, and now knowing that this, this lawsuit is either coming or about to come, 
they're going to try to cap their damages because if baby dies, there's no future medical care. Cases capped out at 500 or 500,000 or a million dollars at the most. So we, we, when we drafted the complaint, we made sure that we added a line and a complete count. And here's a copy of the complaint that I've pulled out. Intentional affliction of emotional distress. That, folks, is not part of the medical malpractice cap. That's a plain old tort. And in Florida, no caps on torts, only on medical malpractice. So we thought that that was a creative tool to kind of get around the medical malpractice cap by bringing a, a very important claim. We also thought, well, how are they going to defend this case? Medical malpractice lawyers use this beautiful ACOG document, this three-tiered classification on how you review met, uh, fetal monitoring strips. Interestingly, um, the guy who wrote it, Dr. McConus, upon reviewing the deposition of Dr. Bayouth, is agreed to be our expert. So we will not be facing or staring down the receiving end of this very difficult and very tragic article which makes our lives very, very difficult. You know, I just wanted to call a little bit of attention to some of the things that we've done in this case, uh, kind of put ourselves in the, in the shoes of the defense, think about what the defense is going to do before they do them, and, and I think get great experts, which is one of the things that we've done, and take some risk too by deposing this doctor and, and asking the questions that we needed to ask, putting our foot in the pool, and getting the right answers, and really have set the case up uh, you know, for settlement, or if not, then hopefully they'll eat it pretty big at a trial.